Welcome to the Fleet Geeks podcast. We're here to help develop fleet and transport professionals. Do you want to progress and develop your skills and knowledge? We promise to bring lively conversation and debate around interesting issues and keep you bang up to date with changes in our awesome industry. The Fleet Geeks are a community of professionals and if you enjoy the podcast, why not join the discussion for free in the Fleet Geek community over on Facebook. This is how we roll. So uh, back, uh, back in the green room, Mike... Tom and I were like, oh, Richie will be here. He'll be here shortly. No problem <laughs> at all. It'll all be good. Um, anyway, we're recording, so we're going to go straight into it. And I can see the attendee numbers sort of uh, pl- uh, going up. Uh, we had over 100 signups for, for, for this session around uh, what should an external transport manager charge. So uh, I thought it was a, probably a bit of a controversial subject. And I've got uh, some fantastic people joining me uh, as panellists on this session. So I'm going to do a quick uh, quick round robin of the of the three of you so you can introduce yourselves to uh, the attendees on this, on this webinar. Um, so, Mike, over to you. You go first, mate. Good, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, yeah, my name is Mike uh, Vickers, and I've uh, recently joined Pete as a part of the flagship team. Uh, very impressed with what's going on down in the, down in Peterborough. Uh, formerly a, uh, I've been a transport, I've been in the transport business all my life now, and all my working life anyway. And um, I've uh, spent the last six years as a trainer for uh, Logistics UK, formerly the uh, Freight Transport Association. So. Um, I come at it from both a training perspective and a, a former fleet uh, fleet manager and transport manager. So that's uh, that's what I'm about. Oh, man. Thank you very much, Mike. Tom, over to you, mate. Right, so good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Tom Reddy. I'm uh, currently a transport consultant, external transport manager, and I also teach the transport manager CPC. So I've been in the industry a long time, done most of the roles over the years, driver, sort of driver trainer, assessor, instructor, those sorts of things. But finding a little bit of a niche now and slowly learning how to work for myself. So fingers crossed, it's all going okay. Good man, thank you very much, Tom. It's a pleasure to have you here. Um, over to you, Richie. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Richie Didden. Uh, currently, well, I'm working now for myself as transport manager and transport consultant. Uh, I'm also part of the admin team on... I've been in the industry for quite a number of years. Uh, growing up in the industry from a small child, then went away and got a proper job, went into engineering and other areas, then came back into transport. Uh, basically, probably found the job that really suits me. I started my own business last set, last February, and everything seems to be going swimmingly at the minute. Yeah, definitely. Brilliant, mate. Brilliant. And it's a pleasure for you to join me as well. Um, all three all, all three of our panellists have uh, featured on the Half Dozen Things podcast as, as guests, and all of the episodes have been absolutely brilliant um, and have had great reviews from people who have listened in, which is why when it came to doing this webinar for, for Fleet Geeks and, and talking about how an external sh- uh, transport manager should or could potentially look at charging, um, obviously I knew it was going to be... Um, potentially controversial. I thought how, how I tend to come up with some of the content that we create with Fleet Geeks and with Flagship is I just look at the groups, the Facebook groups, and you just see the questions getting asked time and time again. The same old questions come up all the time. And uh, I often see what's the going rate for a transport manager. Now, I get, I get really, really frustrated with certain Facebook groups where um, There is like an expectation, a standardized set of rates for external transport managers where new people into into the business, new people looking to get going as externals, think that this is the standard rate. And essentially, I wanted to create some content where we can go, actually, that's not that's not how it is. You're free to set your own rates, essentially, and to discuss sort of how a few people who are very experienced in the sector would go about doing that and how they do go about that. So um, obviously I know it's going to be commercially sensitive information. You're only going to be able to share so much, but I thought it was a good opportunity for us to um, share really how we go about talking about those things. Cause some people might look at it very simplistically. Uh, oh, an external transport manager. Well, if they're happy and the customer's happy, then everyone's happy. Right. But I don't know about anyone else, but, I know that most of the time customers want to pay as little as possible and then they're happy. So it's actually about finding the correct ground, the correct level of input and how we can, how we can value those services that we provide. Um, so hopefully we're going to have a little bit of a debate and a bit of a d- discussion around that with the panelists. So 
I'm going to shut up for a minute and uh, I don't know, I'm going to offer it out rather than picking. Does someone want to take up the mantle first around how they feel about standard industry rates? I guess that's the initial question is how do we feel about industry standard rates? I'm happy to um, to go if you're... Oh, yeah, no worries. So actually, just quickly, what I will do is I see I see there's been a hand go up. What I will say is this is going to be like a 30-minute webinar and then we're going to have time for Q&A after, okay? So what I'd ask anyone listening in to do, if they're able to put any Q&A questions in, we'll deal with those as we sort of go through. And then um, like people can add comments in the chat. But if you've got a question, put them in the Q&A and me and the panellists will have a look at those. Obviously, if we can answer them, we're not the... Bible, we're not God, we don't decide what what's what, um, but we can certainly put our input in. So um, hopefully that's useful. Sorry, Tom, back over to you, mate. Yeah, of course. I just, um, we've talked a lot about pushing back on this idea of the standard rate, but it, it's kind of important, I think, to get a grip of why it's important to discuss this in the first place. Um, and the reason is, if, if you are too quick to adopt, and it's a difficult question to answer, that's why it's such a debate about it, but if you adopt too quickly what someone else is telling you to, to earn um, as your own business, which, which is what it is, you're not an employee and that's a critical part of this whole thing. You're not employed. You are providing a, a contract for services, not a contract of service. So why is it important? Well, what happened in the last two years? You know, the world is on fire. Everything's changed as, as we know it. The boost in certain ways of, of shopping and delivering goods and all the rest of it. The big companies will be very quick to adopt any standard rates that you feel you might want to adopt or maybe you've adopted without really thinking about it too much. And then before you know it, they become the standard, which is what we have seen happen, which is a bad thing. Absolutely a bad thing. Um, you do not want to be in a position where you are being forced, if you want to do a particular job, to adopt a certain standard of fees, because if you don't, everyone else will. And I don't know if you want to get into mentioning names or mentioning amounts, but there are large companies out there right now who have a list which they are presenting to potential freight partners. And they will say, this is what you should be paying for a transport manager. And unfortunately, people are running with that. And that is creating a problem for the industry as well. So that is the why. You need to decide what you need to earn and what you're willing to earn. After all, ask yourself, are you doing this because you want to be an employee? If that's the case, then go maybe go and be an employee and then let someone give you your salary. But if you're looking to run your own business and decide your own rates, that is one of the great privileges of what we do. And it is a privilege. But if you're going to do it, why give away that opportunity to, to sort of set your own life, I suppose? So that's just a bit of a thought on why it's important to discuss it. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, I think uh, you you allude to Dimitri. Uh, Dimitri's the one I know about. I know there's certainly other transport manager agencies out there who essentially help help um, companies source transport managers, and they kind of go, "This is this is the standardised rates we look at." That's that's what you're alluding to, Tom. I think, isn't it? Um, yes and no. Actually, there are those agencies, and and they form a useful tool for very for certain transport managers, and I've used them myself in the past. And I'm, I don't want to say yes or no to whether it's a good thing or not. But um, if we're talking about large commercial companies who have um, no vehicles of their own, but like to work with people they can perhaps offer franchises to, those companies will build you a business plan, which is, again, what we're talking about here. What is your business plan as your transport manager business or your consultancy business if you go down that road? So they will look to get people into their system take on franchises and they'll give you a business plan on the business plan it'll say your transport manager will cost you x yeah. and it's not enough and so we're talking about massive multinational companies here who are doing this and so it's something to be aware of because this problem is not going away no so, it's, it's it's a business model that is uh that is evidently going to be growing over the next few years isn't it as uh, i think we all know, you know we all know who, who, who you might be alluding to there are one of the examples and i think their business model for freight um is going to be copied isn't it it's going to be copied by the other big operators uh, out there so and they'll yeah exactly as you say as a franchisee they will guide you through that in the same way as a mcdonald's franchisee will guide them through uh the, 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 the franchise holder will guide them through those processes um so we've got to be wary of that in the industry i think we've got to be looking out for that and uh, as you quite rightly say tom it's you know why not just go and be a transport manager in that case? Why not go and apply for a job and become a transport manager? It's Why? Good. Because we base so much of our decisions on remuneration, which is a hard word to say, on um, 
what we know as employees and it's hard to hard, 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 hard to break particularly if you've been employed your whole life from 16 17 as many of us have you know it's hard to get a, it, but it is a different mindset you have to start thinking in a different way and it takes a long time and i'm sure pete will agree with this it takes a long time to adopt that way of thinking because that as an employee you're kind of just grateful to get your salary each month but there's a lot to consider self-employed a lot of risks we take a lot of equipment we have to buy and a lot of things we have to provide for ourselves where there's no safety net we're on our own and so one of the like i said the great privilege is to set your own rate so why not take advantage of that stop gearing it towards what can i get away with and start thinking what do i actually want and if people aren't willing to pay what you want then figure out a way to get what you want and so it is a different mindset and I, i'm i'm trying very hard not to come across in any way arrogant because it's i've done my time through the employee and i know how hard that can be even to get a salary increase so mm. i i'm with you 100 percent. but we have to start thinking about things in a different way i think brilliant nice tom can i bring you in here richie what do you think he's still there because my internet keeps going a little bit bit, bit yeah yeah we've, we, we've got you, you. Are, we've got you all right with your internet or can you do, do i keep disappearing now you're there no. You're there just about, mate. Uh, well, basically, what Tom, I know who Tom's talking around, and I've come across it. We've come across it together. We've been, we are dealing with a guy. Uh, I probably look at it a bit different to Tom because I have been self employed before. I've run yeah. a business, I've run two businesses. So I'm a little bit more, I'm not coming across arrogant. I'm a bit more clued up when it comes to being self employed. And this is why. I get a little bit wound up on the groups with when they come up with this rate of 350, whatever a month, uh, because I understand what it's like to run a business and what's involved in running a business. And a lot of people come into this and just think it's, we pass, we do the course, we get our, pass the exam, we get our certificate, let's crack on. And there is a lot more to getting a certificate. You know what I mean? The certificate doesn't, basically give you the power to do the job because you, you've learned nothing from it. Uh, you've got a lot of training and everything to go on after that. So all that further expense has all got, it's all got to be paid for. And if you're only it working for £350 a month plus £100, it's never going to happen. You're never going to get anywhere, are you? You may as well just be in an internal position, getting a salary each month and not having the same worry of how am I going to, Recovery. Yeah. yeah, I think I think I think you'd finished there. I think I don't know if you'd finished or not, but I lost I lost you. So I'm I'm going to take up yeah. from there. Well, I, think, I had finished. Oh, yeah, I'd finished. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> um, I think one of the things to think about that, that I certainly pick up on with uh, people considering going into self-employment, whether it's an e as an ETM or, or or elsewhere as well, it's really taking into consideration all of those perks and benefits you get out of an employed role. If you're in an employed role, you get paid holiday, you get probably your laptop paid for you, you probably get all your internet connection, your phone, uh, car, fuel, potentially, depending on the type of role. But particularly from a car and fuel and accounting point of view, you're probably only going to one set place of work, for example. And then if you travel between places, you're going to get traveling expenses as well. So if you think, you know, essentially one of the things I do when and, and flagship offers a range of services, uh, including training, but when I cost out a new member of staff, for example, I'll probably only work on about 45 weeks a year of productivity because seven weeks is going to be lost a holiday, bank holiday, um, et cetera, et cetera. And then when I measure utilization, I, I normally measure it on a four day week because you can't normally work a fifth day, fifths for administration and that kind of thing. So all of a sudden, if you take what your anticipated salary might be and you start to sort of reduce it down to a 45 week and then actually you then quarter that week because there's only four days of productivity, all of a sudden it doesn't start adding up when you look at these industry standard rates um that, that people talk about it's nowhere near it's nowhere near what it needs to be to even pay a normal full-time role let alone all the additional expenses um and that kind of thing uh mike i've not really heard from you i'll bring you in on this mate yeah i think uh for, from my point of view it's it's the value that you bring to the role it's, it's what the customer is looking for uh and, and i think it's an you know you you two guys that do it um you know uh full-time as it were you'll you'll know better than me but 
I think sometimes it's choosing a customer rather than the customer choosing you, isn't it? It's oh, it's kind of getting yeah. getting the fit. If, if the customer is looking for a functionary, if some if a customer is looking for somebody who can come in and do the basics, and uh, and and you know they're reasonably compliant, um, then then you, you know there's there's no no reason why you shouldn't be looking at some sort of uh, rate based on a on, on a potential salary if you're a real time employee, but. Um, I mentioned it in a post on Facebook. Um, a lot of you guys will be working uh, because you're called in for a reason. There's a there's a there'll be a PI coming up, or there'll be some issues with drivers, etc., bridge strike or whatever. So uh, I, I mentioned this on Facebook, and I didn't quite understand whether people would know who this person was. But I mentioned a guy called Red Adair who used to cap oil wells in the uh, in Texas in the seventies, and this guy would come in if you had a massive oil well fire, and he'd fly in and he'd come in and he'd rescue, uh, you know, he'd rescue the oil well and. Um, or everything would be good again and essentially that's what you're doing and and for that it requires more than just a functionary it requires somebody who's really switched on and he's going to bring value to that now what price do you put on that you know what, what how could you possibly price that based on a salary because an ordinary salaried member of staff wouldn't wouldn't be doing it uh, and the other thing I'm going to just bring into the conversation there is that is what it, what role does a transport manager whether they're employed or or an ETM, what do they bring? I think a transport manager in any organisation, whether they're a haulier or whether they're using vehicles as a part of what they what they do, you know, delivering their services or goods, um, that transport manager should really be sat at the top table of, of corporate thinking yeah. and, uh, and and shaping the future of the, of the company. So um, I see transport managers being a, a quite a senior role. I don't know about you guys, but and, and to use an external transport manager, you bring in value that you probably won't be able to get internally because you're another set of eyes, another set of ears, and all that years of experience and and, and know how. So it's very difficult. I, I wouldn't like to to have to put a value on what what you what you two guys are worth. You know, priceless yes. of course. <laughs> in, in, in interesting point of view, Mike. So I'm gonna I'm gonna bring um, I'm gonna bring back in uh, Richie now, and I'm gonna ask the next question for which I was: How do you approach pricing up with a customer? You don't necessarily need to give away in, in, like you know commercial data, which is um, uh, you know you might you might see as um, you know a breach of uh, a, a breach of your rules with them. However, um, how do you sort of approach that when you go and speak to someone? Are you looking at whether are you a good fit for them as a customer as well, essentially as well? Um, are they the right sort of customer for you, and how does that work? Basically, I think because of work probably so much in my life i've got like my mother my mother has very good judgment she can work somebody out in a very short length of time and i'm not as good as my mother but i've had that much hassle in my life i've gained some of that knowledge i think from my mother so you can usually get an idea of how somebody is off the telephone conversation and nine times out of ten yeah you can't really turn around and say I don't like you. I'm not gonna. I'm gonna walk away you know, and meet the person in general because part of that as well. You never know. It's, it can be different in person, but also I like to have a nosy. You know what I mean? Because you do learn things from having a nosy. Uh, but like where we have this industry rate of so much a vehicle, I've now I won't say I've steered away from it. I have a set rate I start at, but most of mine now, I'll go in. I have, I've, 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 I wrote uh, I, what I call an inset on the cover and use, and I use that when I go to a new client. And basically, like I went to see one last week, well, two restricted operators, and I was with both of them, probably what a good two hours each. And I may not even get the job, but I probably will. And so busy, his phone's ringing even whilst he's on the <laughs> webinar. All because those people what, wanting his services. Well, his agent. <laughs> I've, got, I've got so much going on today, and I've got an auto electrician here working on my van, and he's just knocked on the door, and I got him. Now he's just just to nip out and see what the problem is, because I forgot to tell him I was on this. Uh, where was he at? So really, I get an idea of what that person wants when I go and I talk to them, how I gel with them, 
And now I am an easygoing type of guy. And most people, 99.9% of people I go and see, I get on well with them. Uh, and basically, I just form my price from that. And then a lot of the time now, I am just pulling a price off the top of my head because I have learned so much. And I've learned since 15 months ago. That's been a major learning curve in this industry. Uh, well, a, a very steep learning curve, even for myself that I think has got a lot of experience. I've learned so much in this last 15 months. But I have, I've gained that knowledge now where I can just basically go in, I'll get an idea of how they're running, what the paperwork's like, and then I can just fire a figure off the top of my head. And sometimes I have even been to the odd one thought, and then I've thought, hmm, I'm going to add another £500 a month or even another £1,000 a month because there is a couple of issues there and they probably are going to lead to something. And I've given them the price and they've like, not really nobody's really coughed and uh, disagreed but they've said yeah that's fine and then nine to a lot of the time something has popped up down the road and i'm glad i've put that extra in but uh no it's a very difficult thing to price but i'm just lucky that i've gained that knowledge yeah yeah okay talk that way Thank, thanks, Richie. Yeah, appreciate that, mate. Um, if you need to pop off and sort your auto electrician, you, you go and sort it, mate. Then you are. I'll put you on mute whilst you're there as well, you know, uh, make sure you can't hear you swearing. Uh, Tom, <laughs> Tom, I'll bring you in with that, mate. I can almost feel the people clawing at the screen going, give us a number. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so I'm wary of doing that because we're all different, right? But I can tell you how, how I approach it. And I can tell you, I had a phone call this morning and very similar to what Richie says, you get a feel for people. And my advice is get your price in early because you don't want to be wasting time with people who you know are not going to go in forward into anything. And I can also talk about case studies, if that's useful. Just to pick briefly up on something Mike said, End of story, it's a director level position. If you have any doubts about yeah. that, yeah. go and stand in a public inquiry and ask yourself when the traffic commissioner is attacking you, if you don't feel like a director, because 100% you will, and then you'll go to bed for a week because you're so bruised from that experience. And then you'll come back and think, I need to reevaluate what I'm doing. And, you know, God willing, nobody, nobody wants to go to public inquiry. Some of us who do it regularly do it out of choice. And it is something I enjoy doing now, but it's very much a director level position. So if you're approaching it in any other way, you're approaching external transport manager wrong. And I think that's kind of draw a line under that. Um, in terms of my approach, I, uh, I'm i not the same as the other guys in this room. We're all doing it for different reasons. I'm sure we can agree that my approach, I want to have the life that I want to have. Um, the reason I'm not an employee anymore is that reason I realized I might've had some fairly toxic experiences over the years in the transport industry. I'm sure we can all relate. So I come up with a figure of, everything I want to earn and all my costs on, on top of that. And we can give a figure if you want to. You could say £80,000, £90,000 a year. How do I get to that? Go, How many days a week? Right, you've all been on Transport Manager CPC. We've all sat that course, maybe with Mike. And we know how to cost a vehicle. A vehicle is an asset. Cost yourself out like an asset. So you've got how many days a year that you want to work? Just doing some rough maths. Four days a week is 208 days of, of a year forgetting the weekend idea, because maybe weekends don't matter to you, something like that. Take away 20 days for holiday, you've got 188 days. So divide 80,000 pounds by 188 days, that gives you 425 pounds a day. If you're charging anything less than 425 pounds a day, you're probably not getting to where you wanna go and you're not gonna utilize yourself every day. It's the same as having the intention to run a truck 365 days a year, it doesn't happen, can't be done. And so you have to build this in to your pricing. Okay, so that's a nice figure. There's your day rate. And it's not as hard as you might think, but you have to decide, come back from the other end, what do I need to get at the end of the year? And if you're not, you don't have a business plan, that's your first port of call after today. You sit down and think about, right, what am I doing here? Where am I trying to get to? Personally, I don't want employees. I like working by myself. I like the independence to wake up in the morning and go, not today, thank you. But that's not for everyone. Pete is doing a very different thing over there, but he has to price out all his assets in the same way. Um, and I'm certain he does do it in the same way. You want an hourly rate? Okay, divide your day rate by the hours you want to work in the day. Maybe you only want to work six hours a day. But if you're working eight hours a day, then on 425, your hourly rate is 53. So it'll give you an idea. And if you think it sounds like a lot of money, then you probably got 
the wrong sort of clients and believe me the money like that is out there if you want that and much more besides pete mentioned on one of his podcasts the other day what an health and safety consultant will charge per day and that figure i've just given you doesn't brush close to that so that's my approach or at least it is now if you're sat there like i was probably three or four years ago thinking i don't know how to do this then you're not alone either so don't worry but just learn from this and just realize i've just spent two and a half thousand pounds of my own money on remote downloading equipment that's a choice i make for my own business i just spent 1500 pounds revising my contract with a transport solicitor that's a choice i make for my own business but you don't have to do that but who's paying for that who's paying for the car who's paying for the laptop who's paying for all this equipment so there's a lot of money turning over and those figures are nothing unusual if you're looking in the right places. Nice thing about Facebook is you can get a quick client on there using these agencies and there's not much work for you to do, but that's going to reflect in the price you can expect. So uh, hopefully that's a reasonable. No, I think, I think, I think you've given some great insight there, Tom, to be fair, mate. And, um, and, and I, I very much echo, uh, I'm doing a similar thing. I've got a, um, I've actually got a, a financial director of another company who is helping overlook our figures at the moment because flagship are up to eight people. Now, we, we do do, like you say, a range of different stuff as well, but how we price as a business, and I've just recently done it, is mm. I've put all of the eight people salaries into, into a box. Um, I've put um, the level of productivity that I expect from them and what the utilization may be. And then all of a sudden, I then work out how many days I'm expected to make out of that utilization, how many days we're looking to sell. And then we get a day rate. And the, the, the day rate, you know, to give you an idea of sort of level of investment we're looking at, we've, we've just take, taken on, on the new premises. Yeah. It's been about 11 grand's worth of furniture for the training center. We've got two training rooms. We've got a virtual training room and an office. It's been about 12 grand's worth of furniture. Uh, it's probably similar amount of signage for outside, inside, and all of that kind of thing as well. Um, and, and once we sort of start to put all of that into the melting pot, our day rate is a good sort of a third, uh, a third to two thirds on, on, on top. And that's, and what we have is we have, uh, I have like a structure. It's almost like depending on what you're requiring depends on which member of staff you get, for example. So we might have a slightly different day rate depending on the experience level you need for the work that's being carried out. So for example, we've got, uh, we've got a driver assessor who's taken their TMCPC and not passed yet, but that driver assessor can go and do certain things. And that will be a certain day rate to, in comparison to the, you know, if someone asks for mental health first aid, for example, the level of experience someone to, needs to be able to deliver that to a really high standard is totally different. The same way that we charge for Mike doing his transport manager CPC, having done all the all, all the stuff he's done there, the, the, the day rates will change and that kind of thing. You know, we, we will look from anything from 700 up to 1500 quid at times, you know, depending on what it is we need, the distances traveled and what's, what's involved really. So um, I think conceptually my biggest issue is is that at the moment the standard rates are based on vehicles the number of vehicles and that bears no actual relevance no. to no relevance to what what we actually do and what any of us are talking about um so mike i'm just going to bring you in mate because you've had to sit there quietly and listen in for a minute yeah no uh, uh, you know tom made a very good point you mentioned solicitor um going to see a solicitor now I, i've had to speak to a solicitor recently um a very bang average um divorce solicitor basically uh very very bang average and uh her, her rates are 200 pounds an hour bang average um so you know that put that into 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 a little bit of context now i'm not claiming that we are uh, of that kind of level of legal knowledge but i'll tell you what um in my spare time <laughs> Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm studying a law degree and uh, I can tell you that, you know, the value that we bring to the table, um, you know, whilst it might not be quite at that level, is certainly getting up there, is certainly, uh, you know, not knocking on that sort of door, isn't it? And um, we have, everything's, as you say, expensive uh, business to set up a business and to run a business. And, and you know, well, there are alternatives. What are their alternatives at the end of the day? I'm not saying it's a distressed purchase, but in many cases it is. Yeah. So, you know, without being a too, being a too much of a mercenary position on there, um, what price? I mean, what, you know, the people think nothing of paying uh, uh, for, for vehicles. How much do we pay for a vehicle? How much do we pay for our maintenance, et cetera, these days? It's gone up exponentially over the last few years, hasn't it, to get a decent uh, maintenance contract. 
So, you know, I don't think we should be at all you know, shy or ashamed or worried about what we what we want to what, what we need to charge off, I, I believe. Hi, it's Pete from Flagship Partners. We're really proud to sponsor the Fleet Geeks podcast. Flagship Partners offer a range of consultancy and training services to ensure that our customers remain compliant and have the best possible knowledge to be able to fulfil their work. If you're interested in support with any of our safety, HR or compliance services, or you want to train to be a transport manager or need driver CPC training, give us a call today. That's brilliant. That's a really good point. There is a tendency as an employee, and I can say this from experience, you're very apologetic and very guilty and very shy about your pricing. And because you don't really know, you're out kind of out of your depth a bit. And I get where that's coming from. But obviously, you have to go on what your experience level is. Obviously, you're not going to pitch an operator that's in major regulatory problems with 50 vehicles that are facing a public inquiry if you're fresh out of a, a transport manager's CPC exam. It's just, that's not going to work. And that mentoring is another um, discussion for another day. But with the ability that you know you have, it's a very special niche, what we do. And when you do it well, don't be apologetic about it because the traffic commissioners value it. You should value it. And when you get your customers back where they need to be, yeah. they will value it too. And it's not always going to work. You're going to give them the olive branch and some people will just say no and you can go and look up a case study of this in the west midlands traffic area regulatory decisions i'm not going to tell you the name of the operator but if you go through it it won't take you very long to find me and it's an example of someone who was given all the chances and still decided that the money was not worth paying but ultimately now banned from the industry for life and there aren't many jobs out there and i don't want to draw the comparison with doctors and lawyers because it's not the same thing as mike said but there's not many where you can have your license to practice taken away which we can. And so something else to mention. But yeah, it, it's, it's, easier for, it's, it's much easier for us to lose our license to practice than it is for a doctor. And that's yeah. not no disrespect to doctors, but um, it's much easier for us to lose our license to practice. And that's what I say to my students on uh, transport manager is it is a license to practice yeah, like, like, a, like a solicitor's. Great, great input. Uh, what, what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm just going to raise a poll. I'm, I'm going to sort of o open up for Q&A in a moment. Um, but there's a poll about to launch around, um, obviously, the industry standard rates that we see come across are often vehicle based. So there's a bit of a question for the for the attendees. Should uh, an external transport manager price their fleet by the time or the size of the fleet and what, what the time spent managing it's going to be. So there's a bit of a poll for people to think about there when they think about the industry standard rates. And we're not saying that there's a right or a wrong answer. And at no point during this call or, or webinar, sorry, has any of us said what the right or wrong answer is. Um, I'd just draw a really good uh, comparison actually with the uh, what Tom's just said. I put a proposal in recently to a company to support their safety, their HR, and they've recently opened a showroom and they need like a transport safety management system uh, sort of for their moving vehicles. And I put a price in for a thousand pound a month for one of our guys to go in and look after that, raise employment contracts. And I got told we were a bit expensive. Uh, what I did do was I went back and said, are you sure these are similar scenarios of a company your size because HSE find people on the size of their turnover. Um, they they find people based on the things that have happened. And I've, I've kind of gone, these are companies very similar to yours, three very similar cases for something which actually is, could quite easily happen on a daily basis to yours. And there's several hundred thousand pounds and you're getting someone of a director level uh, of a director level with health and safety experience to come in and help support your business for just as much as you need on a monthly basis. Actually, I think we've given you quite a good, um, uh, quite a good offer there. And actually they turned around and from being way too expensive, they turned around and said, no, actually let's do this. Let's do a 12 month contract. So um, a lot of it is around, um, a lot of it is around actually having the, the strength and the, uh, confidence to be able to maybe challenge people's perceptions of what they think fair and value is uh, to their business. Um, so I'm going to invite some more q and I've not seen any come in yet. Certainly that poll's come through there. I'm just going to have a look at the results on that. Yeah. Interestingly, everyone's voted on that and only 20% um, think that actually external should um, based on fleet size, which is interesting because that's kind of contrary to, to what we've been saying there. So I'd be interested to what people think if that works for them based on a fleet size uh, rather than time spent managing. I'm just going to bring Richie into he's been quiet for a little bit. How's your auto electrician got on mate? All right. Oh, you're on mute, buddy. 
We all right? Yeah, all good. I'm, I'm just going to make it a bit clearer for people, actually, if they're watching back. So I don't think they're going to be able to see. Um, I don't think they're going to be able to see that poll. So just out of uh, out of the attendees, 80 percent have said that ETM should be charging based on the time they spend on a fleet, uh, whilst 20 percent are saying that people should charge based on the number of vehicles or the size of the fleet. Um, yeah. Sorry, Richie. Back over to you, mate. So what did you what were we talking about? I forgot. I've had that much going on. <laughs> the auto electrician. <laughs> yeah, we we're talking about auto electricians. Now they've gone. Now, to be honest, how I much does invite... he charge an hour? <laughs> yeah, how much does your auto electrician charge an hour? Well, I can't really say because some of his payments were cash, so I can't really say. <laughs> but uh, it's reasonable. It's reasonable. <laughs> He's done quite a few jobs on me, van because I'm sort of like making it into a camper, but it's for work. But uh, no, it's cheap. Very nice. We shan't tell the tax man. Right, Richie. Um, <laughs> hopefully HMRC aren't listening. No, um, I'm joking. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on charging based on time rather than size of fleet? What are your thoughts on that, mate? You can't, you can't really do it based on fleet size because it's just every operator is different. There's so many different scenarios. You just... I think I took one on last year and I, I priced him and I did price him well. And I didn't think I was going to have that many issues. And then when I got into it, more issues started coming. I'm glad I didn't just work on the basic. Well, I didn't, I didn't I've never worked on the 350 plus 100 for years. But uh, if I'd have done it on fleet size, I would have been well out of pocket. And now I won't basically... I've been on the groups and people have said to me, oh, well, what? nobody puts prices up. And I've said, well, I start at 550 plus 150 pound a vehicle. But I said, that is a starting figure. And that's all it is. I'll never, I haven't got, I've got too many clients that I work on that figure. And I've basically, they're at a level now where everything's fine. I'm quite happy with them. And really, I could probably pass them on to somebody else now because there's not a great deal of work. But anybody coming on now, it's got to be, I've got to assess it and think how much time I'm going to put into this. Like I have two operators, one, he's only got two trucks. And if I said on here, how much a month I charged him, people would think, Jesus, Dick Tur at least Dick Turpin wore a mask. But he has, <laughs> he only has a couple of trucks, but he has 80 vans. He has 140 staff. And I've known him for 25 years. And, and the guy, I've worked with him before in my previous business. So he knows how I work. And he's quite happy paying that chunk of money because he's got me at the end of the phone. Seven days a week, he's got me at the end of the phone. He can ring me. Well, he won't ring me in the middle of the night because my phone doesn't go to bed with me. But he knows he can ring me at any time with an issue, and I'll help him out, or I'll go and see him, whatever. And he pays that chunk of money. And I have a couple of clients like that, and they pay a huge chunk of money, and but they've got me 24-7 within reason, they basically got me the drivers have got me and that's how it needs to be you can't just go in put a figure in of oh that's 550 pound a month for three vehicles how much work are you going to do for that you know what i mean okay. it's no good the traffic commission doesn't want to see you just going in doing your little bit and then basically well i haven't got the time to spend any more on you he wants you committed to that operator doesn't he and to be committed to that operator, that operator's got to be prepared to pay. And if he doesn't pay or he doesn't want to pay, well, you've just got to move on. I don't know why people seem to be, they're in this industry and they seem to like jump. As soon as there's a job opportunity, they jump straight in, oh, grab that. You know, like, you know the, the industry is huge. And like somebody said to me last year when I started on my own and I was a little bit, skeptical what to do and somebody said to me just go and stand on a motorway bridge on the m6 and you watch how many trucks go under that bridge and he said you'll then realize how vast this industry is so he said don't go worrying about work and don't go worrying about you have to grab that client just because he's paying he may be paying peanuts why do you want the hassle for peanuts you know what i mean if somebody doesn't want to pay fob them off move on there'd be plenty more yeah, like Tom, Tom's messaged me this morning. Tom's basically said the same as me. You've just got to move on and get another one. And there's just too many people that are just they're desperate and they're just clawing at something. But 
you need to put a lot of work in in this industry and you do need to do a lot of lot leg work. And there is too many people that basically just want everything to come to them. And it isn't going to happen in this industry. You've got to go out and you've really got to find that work and you've got to sell yourself. And the last two clients I've been to, they both said to me, we can't get over how passionate you are about this industry. And we can tell that you've been in the industry a while and you just, your knowledge is unbelievable, but you just, the passion falls through. And that's, that's the part that basically hooked them in. And that's, and then I give them the price and it was like, I'm sort of like coughing when I give them the price thinking it's maybe a bit much. And they basically just bit me hand off and said, that's fine, crack on. And that's where you want to be. Definitely. It's, 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 it's an industry for grafters, isn't it, this industry? It's an industry well, it for is. grafters. It is. That is the problem is a lot of people, I think they, I think with COVID, a lot of people have looked at this industry and thought, oh, we can do that job from home. And it has come on a lot of posts where, well, can we do this job from home? Well, yes and no. You can do parts of it from home. And the traffic commissioners know that you can do parts of it from home. And I've, I've, with COVID, I've accepted that. But there's a lot of it that needs to be on site. But you have got to put the graft in. And I think there's just too many now thinking, let's get, the let's get our TM ticket, put our name on a license. We can carry on with our normal day-to-day -day job. And we'll do this on the weekend or on a night or when we can be bothered. And that'll do. And it's an extra few hundred pound a month off each client. And it just doesn't work. You can't do it. But if you're prepared to put the work in, like I've said many times, you can easily earn the money a doctor or a solicitor can earn quite easily. But there is a lot of, there was a lot of pressure and there's a lot of responsibility on your shoulders and not everybody can take that responsibility and handle it. It does take a certain mindset to do it. And I, I'm lucky that I thrive. I don't really get stressed out. I'm not, everybody says I'm not laid back. If I've got any more laid back, I'd be basically horizontal. And it, you, you just, you can't go through life worrying, thinking, What's going to happen next? What's this going to... And that? You've just got to let it go and think, well, whatever happens, happens. I've just got to deal with it. And, and I love the industry because to a lot of people, it is a lot of stress. But to me, I just think it's a challenge. Mm -hmm. And I love a challenge. It's good when I've, and when I've, Sorry, it's good to see all your passion about it. Yeah. It's yeah. really good yeah. to see your yeah. passion, it's, mate. It's an industry um, for that. Just, just, Pete, just, I'm just going to ask Tom and, and Richie, maybe of interest to... Um, the, uh, the the listeners, the watchers. Um, ultimately, then, it's there's going to come a time when you need to divorce yourself from a from a client, from a customer. Yeah. How do you go about it? What's the best way to go about it? Well, as <laughs> if I can go first, as quickly as possible. Don't don't waste time with this. And I know there's an emotional, and I've, I said to Richie this morning, there's an emotional attachment, I think, especially when you start off to your operators. You take personal ownership, it feels like your operator license, and there can be a lot riding on it. And it's not a relationship to be taken lightly. But as soon as, you know, if you've got a reason to go, things have obviously reached a point where things are quite bad. And the other side of that is if they stop paying you, which happens oh, well, yeah. sadly more often than, than you would think. But yeah, you need to extricate yourself quickly. Um, and it is, if you've lost your continuous and effective control that will should be fairly obvious to you just sit there and ask yourself that question if the answer is no then there's a good chance you'd have very little option at that point so you need you need to come off and you need there's a depending on your situation i always say to external transport managers you need access to vol if you don't have access to vol you need to ask questions about why that is mm -hmm. and bearing in mind the application process for vol does not give you access as a transport manager later on if you try and log in with your transport manager credentials if they haven't upgraded you to admin or standard user you won't see anything on there so obviously if you're on there you can remove yourself and that's the first step but don't just remove yourself and disappear you send notification to the operator that you have removed yourself give a reason why if it's valuable um but uh, decide if that's a very final move you've just taken because you've taken yourself off. So there's probably no comeback. So you really need to be certain that's what you want to do and inform the traffic commissioner. Obviously. That is the main thing. You need to write to the traffic commissioner and you don't need to give them chapter and verse because you can drop people in a lot of trouble if you don't want yes. to. Yeah. But inform them that you've taken yourself off um, that this is the actions you've taken. You've given this much notice. You tried to resolve the situation. It hasn't worked and it's come to this. And that's your your job dispensed i suppose the issue for the operator make them aware that if they don't inform the traffic commissioner and many don't within 28 days that license is revoked unless they make 
take steps to get someone else and many because they may not use VOL or they don't know how it works it's kind of I see it as your duty to tell that yeah. operator that this is what they need to do now if they choose not to do it it's up to them but you can expect license revocation within 28 days if you do not communicate with that office and, and I'm guessing uh, I'm guessing that you would have in your uh, agreement with the operator you would have a, a, you know some sort of exit strategy or exit clause in there is that something you would put in as a standard I know it's it's difficult to say. So it's a bit like having a prenup, isn't it? It's a bit um, don't don't bring it up on the wedding day, but it's something you need uh, you need to have in there, don't you? What are your yeah? What are your conditions when you consider the contract broken? We again, transport manager CBC time again. We think this is an abstract qualification, but we learn all about contracts. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And so, what consists in your eyes is a break of that contract, which is why you shouldn't be using a standard contract template. Get your own based on your needs and decide. One, if there's a time-based way to end the contract, but what co what consists of breach of contract? And you decide that, and if they've signed up to it, okay, this is what's happened. You've breached my contract, so I consider the contract entered, and I'm sorry, but that's it. Um, time to move on. We know how long it takes to get a license processed, and that's why we have this attachment to it, because as soon as you're off, you just head in hands. Here we go again, another six months potentially, or they are turning around quicker now, but it is a big Big issue but do not be afraid to step away because for many of us particularly external that is the option you're left with more often than not yeah great that's that's a really, Thanks, really, good, really good points there Tom. I mike I'm, I'm just going to move on to the q a's because we have had a couple of questions coming and yes. i would say to people listening there is that opportunity to ask questions live so someone i've just picked up very early on mark has asked us are we recording should he lose connection uh, and wants to review yes we are recording um He's also said fleet size may start. It's good to see you're still with us then, Mark. Um, he's also said fleet size may start the conversation, but ultimately your time is money. That's mm, absolutely, uh, absolutely true. And then I think we've got a couple of bits in the chat as well here. So I just wanted to work through those. Yeah. Um, I've got uh, Anthony, I quote based on a minimum fee for the TC starting hours and then an hourly rate for any additional hours. Nice. Um, Donald, if you know the turnover of the transport company, could it be based on a percentage of the turnover? I think um, that would be nice if I worked with Asda. I'd quite like that. <laughs> yeah. um, I would, I would um, say be very cautious with that one. Be very yeah, cautious. I'd, I'd if be you're not cautious. familiar with director level accounting, the turnover is vanity at the end of the day. Yeah. It doesn't necessarily indicate anything one way or another. And those figures, if you're not familiar with them, can look astronomical. And so you lose its very abstract concept to go on turnover you're looking at what time what do your time's worth and how much of that time you're going to need to invest in that in that operator really yeah absolutely one of our other delegates has put my first contract was 150 per month retainer plus 20 pound an hour uh, since then it's been set uh, 350 plus 100 um I'm still new to the external game, always worked for companies as a TM in the past. It's very different to see this side of it um, versus 35 grand for being in charge of a, your own fleet. Uh, Sammy's asked a question here to all of us. Um, do you charge extra for letters to the TC for a negative roadside encounter good, good or point, time preparing for a PI, et cetera? Mm. I'm going to put that to Richie. Richie, what do you think? Always oh, frozen. Richie, Richie is frozen, isn't he? Um, right. Tom, uh, well, I oh, I have it in my cup to do every single. Well, I'm back in. You're back, yeah, in, back in. You're back, back in. You're back in, mate. Yeah. Uh, my price. Well, I have a pricing where I'm basically covering everything. So any policies, procedures, anything like that, all that is in the in the package. But I do have a clause in the contract where. If there's anything that involves a DVSA, the police, or the traffic commissioner, that is extra and it's charged at an extra hourly rate. So even though they have got me for that big sum initially, if there's something that goes on, so it might be something that's gone on behind my back, I know nothing about, and then we end up with the DVSA and the traffic commissioner on, then they are paying extra. But as a general rule, if it's just normal letters to the OTC or anything like that, all that's included in it. Yeah. There's, um, there's, there's a distinction there between what's your normal duties and what is um, above and beyond. And I'm sure Mike's got this on his desk as well. Oh, yeah. <laughs> statutory documents, stat right? Drop, stat not free, yeah. <laughs> your statutory document has the broadest of broad outlines of what a transport manager involves. And it's not a short list, but that's only the starting point. And beyond there, 
individual companies will have different things. And if your monthly fee is healthy enough, i.e. you've costed it properly, you're not going to feel bad about writing a letter here and there. If you're thinking about charging extra for things like letters, et cetera, that's some, maybe a clue that you're not charging enough. But if it's something like a PI or DBSA investigation or something has gone wrong, then yeah, you, you need to look. And in your contract, you would have your hourly fee for extra time or your day rate because a PI is at least a day out um, with the traffic commissioner. <coughs> Uh, not a fun day if you've not been before um, and so make sure you're charging appropriately for that but in letters here and there and applications here and there if you're thinking about i need to charge extra then there's a good chance you're not charging enough in the first place yeah, yeah. good 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 points i think um i think there's a couple of things i want to add we've had another q a come in so i'm just gonna go on to that in a moment uh, i think what's coming out's really really important is about setting expectations very early so as part of any pricing strategy you do this setting of expectations boundaries when is okay to call, when is not okay to call, what are the expectations, what happens in this situation, what happens in that situation. I think it's very uh, important that we get those agreements in place as an external transport manager with the operator, that they're very much in there. And that will involve almost interviewing a potential, a potential client and asking them, what will happen in this situation? What will happen in that? And you can then draw up um, the proposal. And I just wanted to sort of make a point before we sort of start to look at closing the session. What's what's my incentive for doing this? And it's quite interesting, actually, because my biggest goal is to improve road safety overall, which is why we've got fantastic professionals on here as, as part of the panel. But ultimately, I was... I interviewed a guy called Neville Wright who owned a business called Kiddy Care. He sold it to Morrison's and Kiddy Care provided prams and push chairs and baby stuff, right? And I said to him, how did you feel about the competition? And he goes, I used to love uh, like John Lewis, Robert Sale. He goes, because they'd invest in all the glossy brochures. They'd invest in uh, making sure that people realised the quality of the equipment. And then I'd be selling to them too. And it's actually a very similar thing, right? Is actually... If the industry improves standards, if the industry increase rates for everyone, it impacts everyone positively. It's good for everyone. It's good for the business as a whole, because if we're all on the same page and actually trying to drive value, and I'm not here telling anyone what they should and shouldn't charge, unlike other people, but there's people out there who are driving, they're driving the value down of what we do. And actually what we've got to do is push back and push back up as a, as a whole, as a team. We're not, we're not actually in competition because as Richie very rightly pointed out, go and stand on any bloody flyover and see the number of vehicles going up and down the motorway. It's, it's a huge industry for the right people at the right level of professionalism. There's, there's plenty of opportunity for everyone, I think. I so, do. Sorry, Pete. Um, I do always find it very difficult to understand why people are so keen to push back on, on a price and, and push it down very publicly. Uh, it never something that sits, sits well with me. And we could be talking external transport managers against each other. I think often that comes from a place of uncomfortable or maybe a place of fear. I'm stuck with this operator. I haven't charged them enough. Now I feel trapped and I can't get out of it. And so I'm going to push back to make my decision feel better. You really have to this job is all about humility and understanding we're not going to get it right all the time. We are just human, but trying to improve on things and be willing to make mistakes and then put it right and go forward to where you want to be. But don't push back on people's prices because yours, are, yours are different. That's not the way to behave. Yeah. Brilliant. I've got, we've had an influx of Q and a now. Yes. Um, so uh, I don't know if you guys can see them or not. Or whether okay, just, we yeah. see them, yeah. Yeah, you can see them too. So would you bother chasing payment in court if an operator has not paid your last two bills and report it to the OTC? You're, you're perfectly entitled to chase unpaid invoices. They are issued invoices. Whether or not it's worth the headache is up for you to decide. Um, and so I would, that would be my approach. Many, many I have let go because I just, I can't, I just want to move on mentally and draw a line under it. And but I know plenty of people who would chase every penny, and you've been quite entitled to do so. It, on this, on the subject of invoicing, is it worth? I know it's a different <coughs> topic, but is it worth mentioning that you need to you're self-employed and you need to be invoicing self-employed for transport money? And I know there's that always divides opinion, and in many cases by people who've never had it tested legally because they're charging as a consultant and they're getting away with it, and it's no issue to them, but it's never been put to the test. But you should be officially, as an external transport manager, charging invoices self-employed. Thank you very much, Tom. Uh, that uh, categorizes that one. Um, does everyone Sorry. in? Sorry, man. 
I just said sorry. I've um, I've had that one tested, and yeah, yeah. no one says they've been up in front of the TC, but very few have. And then when you made to look silly, you just benefit from other people's experiences if you can, if you can be humble enough to do that, you know. Yeah, I was going to say I I sought I sought the advice on on the limited. I think there's maybe a whole other webinar there, but I sought the advice on the limited company slash, um, and I think Richie's opinion is slightly different on this actually, but. Um, yeah, the limited company sole trader, and I was categorically told it must be as a sole trader individual um, is the advice I've had. But I think that's for another webinar. Definitely. Uh, I was going to say, that's a big subject all on its own. Richie's smiling as well. So maybe that's time for another one sometime. Um, Alan said, does everyone invoice separately for expenses or do they just do a flat invoice for the month? I think flat invoice to include in expenses is yeah. my expectation. Um, so I, I'm, I'm just going to close that one off. One, one thing I would say regarding expenses, stop stop using your own taco software for other companies it's their taco software those companies that you know those etms out there have got their own software i suggest the company has their own software it's their data and you have access to their data and they pay any uh, you know subscription fees on their software and that kind of thing separately um uh, that's something i come across quite regularly uh, mark's asked how easy is it to turn up to a pi just to observe any other Very easy. use to to attending such i think so I, i'm just going to challenge that i think usually it's okay but i think at the moment they're still oh, close COVID, to the public yeah. i think they're still close to the public i know because jamie jamie went jamie from our team went to one in cambridge uh it was not much more than a month ago um and uh one of our colleagues had wanted to go and was told they weren't able to so i think at the moment they're still not open to the public yes. but usually usually they are my understanding is yeah. there we um one of the trainers I work with, he tries to attend regularly. And I think we could all be coming at it from different traffic areas, interestingly, because I'm in uh, Wales and the West Midlands and you're over in the East and maybe office to office, they have different procedures. In terms of physically going, maybe not, but remote um, viewing is becoming much more of a thing. So you can log in via Zoom and you can observe what's going on. And obviously public inquiry, the clues in the name, it's supposed to be open to the public. And if they discuss some sensitive information, they may say no, but on the applications and decisions, if you scroll down to public inquiries, you will see the specific caseworker, not at the OTC, but at the office of the traffic commissioner, whichever one it will be, who is um, tasked with planning all the PI. So you can contact them directly via email and they will simply say yes or no. But I'm sure all of us in the room will agree it's one thing every particularly external transport manager should make a point of going. Absolutely. Valuable Absolutely. experience. And uh, absolutely not necessarily in the hot seat. If you can go as a member of the public and not be shouted at, then that's even better. <laughs> yes. So, yes. So here's, a, here's a little thing. I'm just going to have, have my moment. One of the things that Mike, Jamie and I have been discussing is actually doing. So we've been looking at running like a peer to peer group where, where we get transport managers together to do stuff. And one of the things that I do on an annual basis is actually hold a PI um like as in a, a trial pi mike could be uh mike could be the traffic commissioner and then you'd have um essentially reporting and you'd actually see it live and actually get to be part of it some of the questions you'd get asked i thought that'd be a fantastic experience for people if that was something they'd be interested in doing a uh doing a public inquiry in that way i think there'd be real value right i'm just going back over to the questions i'm conscious we said people two o'clock and we're one minute away and i'm sure i'm sure uh, everyone needs to get on with their day so just quickly uh stephen as it looks like he's agreed with what i was saying earlier about that not only that but the reputation of the industry improving would help people businesses directors appreciate the role of the transport manager totally agree point, with that yeah. uh mark get payment ahead removes issue of non-payment um, nice if you can do it some, someone went to a cambridge pi two weeks ago was really straightforward uh called ahead before the pi and was confirmed uh, that they were able to go so um yeah brilliant um i'm gonna i'm gonna conclude there gents um and i think we'll obviously we, we have more webinars coming up and uh podcasts as well so there's always an opportunity for that uh everyone who's come along to listen i really really appreciate it thank you to all stop. The can i just fire one little thing in go on richie <laughs> go for it mate go for mike's, it mike's, this is to do with payment mike's just said it's good if you can get payment up front right to me if you can't get payment up front don't even put your name on the license all my clients pay a month in advance. The day they get the invoice is the day they pay, right? So really, you're not going to end up with people owing your money because to me, if they haven't paid you within a week of that date, 
to me, it gets quite serious. I've never been in the position where I've basically said, you haven't paid me, I'm going off the license. But I will get to that point because if you go to a solicitor or any consultant that That's along true. their mind, nine Very times true. out of 10, you are paying in advance or you're paying mm -hmm. a lump sum up front. So to me, if that, per, if that operator cannot pay you your monthly fee in ahead, there's something seriously wrong with the operation. So to me, I would say to any TM, get your payment up front. The day you sign that contract is the day each month you want payment. And if they don't get it and you haven't got really basically got it within that month, you need to be going. So yes, the most they're ever going to owe you is a month, but I'm probably being a bit harsh and it would get to a week and that would be me going and that would be me telling them. But you shouldn't be in a position where they're owing you two, three months payments. And I've had many messages of people where they're owed two, three, four mm. months. Yeah. And I just ask, why have you let it get that far? It shouldn't have got that far. But anybody that works in arrears in this industry, I'm sorry, but you just, you're off your trolley. And Good that's point. it. That's Good all point. I can that's say. Love that. Richie, Richie given a little bit of honest pie for people. Right oh, there. Yeah. I hope he's paid his auto electrician up front. <laughs> then? I hope you paid your auto electrician up front. <laughs> well, it, it turns out, and the first thing I said to him, what do I owe you? And the more ah, you, you, say, go, you see, yeah. Good for you, mate. Good for you. Right then, um, again, so thank you very much for that, Richie. That's really good input. Tom, great to see you again. Richie, great to have you on. Mike, thank you for joining us as well. Um, really, really appreciate the panellists coming on. Uh, I hope people have got good value from this. I hope it's going to create a bit of an asset for people to refer back to. Um, when the question does come up into the groups around what should an external transport manager charge, the answer is we don't know as much as you do, but hopefully we have shared some insights for people to be able to make an informed decision about how they approach that subject themselves. Um, Please stay tuned. Fleet Geeks podcast, uh, Half Dozen Things podcast. Uh, join the, the Facebook groups. Come and have the conversation. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming by and, uh, and listening in. We do really, really appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, thank guys. You. Thank you very much, all. Thank you. Cheers, guys. Take care. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, please share with your friends and colleagues too. Join us for free on Facebook with the Fleet Geeks community for transport and fleet managers. Fleet Geeks offers ongoing professional development, networking and mentoring too. So get in touch with me, Pete Rushmer, on any social media platform to find out more.